Well, welcome back to Bible class. Glad that you're with us and glad that you're going to take an opportunity to study God's word with me. And hopefully this series of messages and classes on the books of Nahum and Habakkuk have been as helpful to you as they have been to me. We're finishing up chapter three today, and then Lord willing, next quarter, we'll have another class together. Uh, thinking we're going to do premillennialism, just kind of giving you some main tenets of the doctrine and how to define and defeat what they typically would believe. Uh, I've seen a lot of that come about during this pandemic and during the difficulties that we've seen. And so thinking that's what we're going to do. And uh, for those of you that have been in the adult class, it'll be a little bit of a refresher course for you, but nothing too incredibly exhaustive like we had for that entire year that we studied the book. Uh, but I look forward to studying that with those of you that'll tune in and watch it with us and study together. We're finishing up Habakkuk chapter three today, and I've entitled this chapter, Prayer and Rejoicing in the Lord. If we were to outline the chapter, the, there is a request, verses one and two, a review, verses three through 15, rejoicing, verses 16 through 19. Chapter three starts off with the following words, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigianoth. That's to be above something, that word there. And it says in verse 2, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. Basically, Habakkuk is saying, do what you are going to do, but please bring us home. In your wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk understands, finally, fear is drawing him closer to God. And the same should be done today. This is another one of the key verses of the book. We have Habakkuk 2 and verse 4, the just shall live by his faith. And then also chapter 3 and verse 2, I've heard your speech and I was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. Verse 3 says, God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. This is a statement about Babylon's coming from the east. God's judgment came from Teman. He's praising God because he understands that this is God's business. See, Habakkuk has shifted from his earlier view when we started studying in chapter 1 and even in chapter 2. He's finally starting to see that while he doesn't necessarily understand the plan, he understands the author of the plan, and that's enough for him. He says in verse 4, his brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand, and there, was, there his power was hidden. Hiding of his power, because it came forth, and it came out of hiding. Verse 5 says, Before him went pestilence, and fever followed at his feet. God stood and measured the earth. He's in charge. I don't know what happened to the world that we started to get it in our head that he's not in charge, that we started to believe that we could make up the rules and we could decide on society. But let me just honestly tell you something real quick. You see the way our country is. You see the way our world is. Could it be possible that part of the very reason we are in such a hole in immorality is because man has decided what is moral and what is not? And that majority rules is not necessarily the wisest way to rule a country. That majority rules is not necessarily the wisest way to look at what's moral and what's immoral. We let the majority vote on things, and we're going to be in trouble. Perhaps that's the biggest problem with our country. Society has started to decide what is morality and what is immorality, and they can't make up their mind. And they have forgotten and neglected the one in charge. Verse 6 says, he stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. Those mountains there represent the human governments. The human governments bowed. Those hills, the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. God is in control. Daniel chapter 5 tells us that God rules in the kingdoms of men. God sets over the kingdom whoever he wills to rule. We've forgotten that. We've neglected that. Perhaps the people that are put into office, whether you and I agree on who, the, who is it, the right candidate or who isn't, perhaps they're put in for a purpose. 
and maybe sometimes if we could look at it without a party and we could realize first and foremost we're Christians before we're anything else, but if we could look at it without seeing blue or without seeing red or without seeing red or without seeing blue, however you want to call it, we would see who's really in control. It's not the Republicans. It's not the Democrats. It's not the independent parties. It's not the libertarians or whoever else you want to throw into the mix. It's simply God. And that's a God worth serving. Habakkuk says in verse 7, I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. Cushan, Ethiopia, Edom. The point is, these powerful nations, although hostile to Jehovah, were taken care of by God's power. And all oppressors of God's people, including Babylon, will also be punished. These individuals who stand against the Lord will suffer for it, even if you don't see it. Even if you're not around to witness it, they will suffer. Verse 8 says, O Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? The answer to this question is no. The rivers were simply God's tools. You think about the Red Sea, the Nile, the Jordan, Galilee. God used them as tools to complete his tasks, to complete his work. Verse 9 says, Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows, Selah. You divided the earth with rivers. Why was God so angry? Why did he open up his armies this way? The bow was made quite naked, the King James verse version says it was basically removing it from its sheath it's not covered up anymore the rod has taken an oath to be true look at deuteronomy 32 and verses 40 through 30 43 with me for i raise my hand to heaven and say as i live forever if i wet my glittering sword and my hand takes hold on judgment i will render vengeance to my enemies and repay those who hate me I will make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the heads of the leaders of the enemy. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his land and his people. The rods of chastisement was Babylon. Babylon. Verse 10 says, the mountains saw you and trembled. Remember that, that, red, red, uh, that reference to the nations. They saw you and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. Overflowing water, Babylon. This is an exaggeration for the sake of emphasis here. Speaking of the mountain, they're trembling and all of these things. It's kind of a Psalm 148 mindset. Habakkuk 3 and verse 11 says, The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went, at the shining of your glittering spear. This isn't a terrible event if you stop and think about it. But it can also be a great event of some kind. Joshua 10, 11 through 12. Habakkuk 3.12 says, You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. This is not anger of haste. This is righteous anger. This is not God being, you know, reactive to something in a in negative way, but in a positive way. Righteous anger. You ever have somebody cut you off on the interstate and you have some righteous indignation as you hit the horn? You ever have somebody mistreat you and as you tell them, I don't really appreciate that, you're, you're upset, but it's righteous indignation. What God had done in the past, Habakkuk is petitioning him to do again. God's going to do it in his time. Verse 13 says, You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundation to neck, Selah. God went forth to save his people, and captivity was the only way to do it. God has saved the remnant because they were captured, and without the remnant, there is no Christ. But everyone was wounded, wounded from head to toe. The remnant were not spared from the captivity, and they weren't spared from the hardship and the tribulation, but they were delivered from it. That's the purpose when you stop and think about a remnant. The remnant is set apart from the other people, but they suffer all the same until the end. Wounded from head to toe. 
without that remnant, there's no Christ. Verse 14 says, you thrust through with his own arrows, the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. And Babylon's attempts to bring the same type of destruction and captivity to Medo-Persia was not going to be allowed by God. God does keep his promises. And friends, brethren, we need to remember that. We look around and we, we can't physically see God, and so we get these blinders on that basically give us this mentality that out of sight, out of mind, God must not care about us. God must not be involved. God must not really consider what happens to us in this life, and all of that is false. Here's Habakkuk in chapter 1 saying, God, how can you use such a wicked nation? And God replies and says, look, I'm going to work a work that even if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. And that work was that Babylon would deliver his people to captivity from their wicked ways to punish them for their wicked ways, Deuteronomy 28, verses, I believe, 15 through the end of the chapter. And all of this that's taken place, yes, Babylon is wicked. I'm not going to let them get away with this, though. I keep my promises. Babylon will suffer, too, in due time. Verse 15 says, you walked through the sea with your horses through the heap of great waters. This is an end of the review of God's work in the past, and that's quite a track record, isn't it? Verse 16 says, when I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. He starts to shake. Babylon is coming, and he cannot stop it written before the Chaldean invasion, trembling thought on how this is going to occur. And verse 17 says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, there'll be desolation. There's going to be trial. There's going to be tribulation. There's going to be problems. Yet, and in some ways, (laughs) those are my favorite three letters of this entire book, yet. And don't we all need to remember that? Yes, though the fig trees may not blossom or fruit be on the vines or labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Hope. Though the country be shut down, though citizen fight against citizen, though food be missing from the grocery stores, though the buildings have to be shut down and online services have to begin, though it looks like we'll never get back to normal, though it looks like this country will further and further tear itself apart with its own citizens. Yet, I choose, and I hope you do too, to trust in the Lord and to rejoice in the Lord. I have learned in my life, and it's a short one, but I've learned in my life, stop trusting in men and start trusting in God. Politicians won't save us. Our government officials, they won't save us. God will. Our citizens won't save us. God can, and only God can. And Habakkuk had this mentality when the book first began that I don't know how in the world God's going to get this done, and he ends the book by saying the following in verse 19. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on my high hills to the chief musician with my stringed instruments. There will be victory. God will bring home the remnant. And what a beautiful way for this chapter to end. What a beautiful way for the book to end. It's not like when we read in Jonah where Jonah doesn't understand God's plan with Nineveh. And the book ends with Jonah basically saying, you either destroy the city or I'm going to sit up here until you do. And we don't know what became of Jonah. 
but we can see what became of Habakkuk, at least by the end of this book. The Lord God is my strength. I'm going to start trusting in him. And shouldn't we all do the same? What a blessing to study such a small portion of Scripture, Nahum and Habakkuk, but all of the lessons that are applicable today for you and for me, all of the things that we can see and that we can know and that we can do and we can focus upon simply because God took the time to tell us. I have enjoyed this class, and I hope you have too. Lord willing, next week we'll pick up with a new class. But until then, thank you for studying with us, and Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday or right back here next week.